to another person. Three awards have right to set limitation on the time to present the public comment. We are guided to posting appropriately according to the bylaws. Secretary, we can then mark we'll keep the time if there are any comments. Just make sure we're all on track. And then I want to emphasize that we're signing out beforehand and then we will call you as chair in order on the sign up. Even from first and so on. Speaker comments should be directed to the chair, not to individual board members or staff. Board members shall not participate, but shall only hear out the board comments. If they request for a follow up of the information or questions asked to the board, the secretary will state the name and address of the individual and will submit that request in person. Again, we emphasize that when the sign up is over there behind the Matthews, the people will begin the meeting if anybody wants to sign up.
copy of our last meeting minutes, August 10th, 2021. Please review those and just make sure that there are not any corrections in each day. And then we'll make a motion to accept the Okay, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor, I would like to ask Ms. Roby, our principal, for her update. Go ahead. All right. So, uh, within your folder, I've added a couple of handouts, uh, three handouts tonight that I want us to reference. I want to give you an update on our, our progress with accreditation. Uh, so, in the left pocket, your first two handouts like this. Uh, just capturing the reasons again why we're going through accreditation. Um, and I think the last time KSD has gone through accreditation was 1996. Um, so that it's a continuous improvement approach um, and analysis to what we're doing is that part of that self-study, uh, strategic planning, and accreditation by our organization for deaf schools. Uh, and it's an opportunity to have diverse perspectives uh, when the eval outside evaluation team comes in. Um, and then we get to have stakeholder involvement and a commitment, as well as it's just, it's good PR. As we said, there's 24 right now uh, schools across the nation that um, are accredited, and we want to be number 25. So um, the 12 standards I have below. And we are doing an analysis around all those 12 standards. I'll give you a second to read those.
So uh, we have three main phases. And right now we are in phase two um, and getting ready uh, this Friday to uh, our team leads will be presenting their first round of goals. Um, and the core team uh, will be reviewing those goals and uh, reviewing those to make sure alignment, uh, that there is data to back up the decisions for the selection of those goals. Um, and then, so we're moving right along and then behind it is just, you can kind of see our timeline. So I, I can't say enough about our team leads. Um, and we've had uh, Scott, Debbie, and Rhonda to work on the school profile, which is a part of our application process. So uh, lots of work is going on. We had put out our surveys to uh, parents, to uh, the community, to students and staff. Uh, around the 12 standards, uh, we have reviewed those um, on a scale of five. We're happy to say right now, um, all are three or higher, because really there's not that perfect five. So we, we want to be in that three to four range. And uh, right now we only have one goal or one uh, indicator that is below a three. And we were already working on a resolution to that. So that's already actively being addressed. So we're, we're pretty pleased. Uh, we've had feedback from retired teachers, community uh, staff. And so we're, we're pleased so far uh, and we'll just see how our goal setting up. So I'll keep you all informed on our progress with that. Um, next, I would like to share with you, uh, I believe I shared in the past, how we are really focused on formative assessments. We started collecting those last year daily and um, figuring out it, it's been a, a big undertaking to be able to track formative assessments for every teacher, every class um, across the day. And so that process has been uh, refined this year thanks uh, to our curriculum coach, uh, coach uh, Janice Ferguson, and uh, our digital learning coach, uh, which is Erin Wagner. So actually, if you kind of skip uh, to the back, this is what we call our data dashboard. And I'll give you, uh, I'll give you a second to look at the front page only, then I will explain it. So um, we wanted the data to be accessible uh, to our teachers. So this is uh, through a portal that our, our teams can access. Uh, if you see at the top, they can pick a week. Actually, this is through October 18th. Uh, when I pull this, you'll see our average reporting across the school is 88%. We may have some days where a teacher, due to good reasons uh, for not reporting an FA, depending on what was going on in the classroom, or they may not have done an FA that day as they were supposed to. Uh, but you'll see in the green is mastery, partial mastery and needs improvement. And then we're monitoring our learning targets, targets taught In the ones that are met. 
So at this point in time, our school has covered 658 standards with 912 learning targets met. So this helps us monitor where our kids are. Uh, if you look across, we have elementary, middle, and high, and look at that data. Um, this does not monitor rigor, but it does keep us on track how our kids are progressing overall. Um, we also are asking our teachers to uh, do data improvement walls, and that is where uh, the classrooms have identified a collective goal for students, and then the students, um, they have their data wall and the students interact with that data and they're part of that data collection and analysis. If you want to see an example of that, uh, when the meeting's over tonight, I'll show you one of our data walls uh, from uh, our math teachers. So we're very focused on the data. We're very focused on student growth. Another thing that we've been working on with our uh, teachers is based on their feedback is training for differentiation. Uh, we did a training this fall uh, that was highly interactive and uh, teachers loved it. We're following up with coaching and uh, that just-in-time coaching and additional training and support. And our teachers were very responsive. They reached out to the trainers who provided that internally because we like to utilize our in-house expertise. So we're very pleased with that and also our lesson planning, uh, we have components that are expected to be in those lesson plans and monitor those and get feedback um, and differentiation is, is a part of that. We use a plan, do study act approach. What's your plan? How are you gonna teach it? Uh, what was, what occurred? What was the success? And we really want the students to be a part of that discussion. And then what's your next step? What are they going to do the next day? So that is for uh, curriculum instruction. Any questions on that? I will say that I'd like to commend uh, Principal Roby and her staff. I think those assessments and taking a look at those things uh, are so important for student growth. And I love the reports that you, you've done and the, being intentional with what you've done. It's, it's, a, it's a very, very good. Um, next, our uh, safety update. Yes. Okay, I just want to just say that um, I've had an opportunity to set up lately in the classroom here, and I did notice the data walls. Um, and I asked for some clarification on what they were because I wasn't sure at first, but it's very fascinating compared to you know, where they started and where they're ending up, and it's nice to see that visual. Um, our safety. Yeah, the kids were actually the ones explaining. <laughs> well, and, and again, it's that I've talked to you all before about Baldrige. It's, it's using when you invite the kids to be half of the solution, they're more engaged. Uh, they're more engaged to. Uh, Hi, Nancy. Thank you for joining us. We're currently in the update from Ms. Willie. Um, so on the agenda, you'll see um, a section on the agenda, our principal update. And then there should be a copy of the agenda. Uh, last, just finished by Mark Thomas, doesn't it? And feel free to say that. So, uh, last time, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Do you want to read or go ahead? Oh. Proceed. I'm sorry. Don't want to interrupt. Feel free to interrupt if you have a question. Okay. Um, last time we talked about uh, Jared had been looking into a system uh, that's campus wide for alerting because right now, oh well, in the past, we have not had a system that's campus wide uh, where all buildings talk to each other. 
uh, we've been working with the company and uh, called Alert Us. And so Jared has hooked up where all of our computers and we practiced the other day during the fire drill. And I don't know if you all were here when that happened, but it will overtake a smart board or your computer, anything that is on our network. It, uh, it captures that and the message that went in, fire drill. And so that comes across whatever teachers are working on in the classroom. So uh, that is Canvas Fly. So we're very happy with that. Uh, right now we have the free version. Uh, we don't know if we can afford the, I think it's $5,000 a year for the more enhanced version. Uh, but right now we've been on a waiting list for a very long time to get this. So we're, we're very pleased. Uh, so we'll continue to, to practice with that. But it is nice to know in case of an emergency, we can do that quickly. Up to now we've been using the Remind through our phones, but this is uh, it's more prominent in the classroom. Um, our numbers for trespassing, uh, safety concerns on campus. Uh, we've had 90 plus trespassers in the past two years, with 10% of those being, uh, and I never say it, bird girl, I, I can't say it. Yeah, that's it. It, we got robbed. Uh, and squatters. We've had uh, folks uh, throw tents up in our fields or uh, at buildings uh, really close to where our kids live. So uh, our student life does an excellent job of anytime um, there is an incident, we will be on the phone at midnight, one o'clock in the morning, Andrew. And I, with the dorm director, if any incidents arrive, uh, and then if there's any trespassers, but there's not an immediate threat the next morning, uh, we have an email from Student Life. Uh, Andrew, uh, our security director, logs all of that. And then if necessary, the police are contacted and then uh, followed. So uh, with that being said, we have submitted uh, a request for purchase of new surveillance cameras and keyless entry uh, for our buildings. And uh, that is approximately $800,000. Uh, so we are trying to secure that through uh, ESSER funds. And ESSER funds are the funds as part of the federal relief. So uh, that has not been approved yet, but uh, we think we've written a strong justification for that, so we're going to try that. Uh, if that meets all the requirements, we should be good. Uh, we are also, Andrew's done a really good job of uh, doing uh, aerial views and layout of fencing. So right now we're in the process of getting estimates on fence, perimeter fence for the campus. Uh, as well as gates. So we've had uh, one person come down to look at the main gate. Uh, the main gate would be at Argo. That would be the, the primary entrance. So that will be where the, the fancy gate is. Uh, we've got a drawing in for that. We're going to pass it to the cement bank uh, And then the other entrances will just be a basic working electronic case. Um, yes. I was just going to say that um, are your staff able to use the ID cards? Maybe is that in the plans? And Not yet. Yeah. Just yeah. 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 At Florida School, we have to have where each staff member has their badge that will allow them access to campus. Um, everyone, you know, is different, but the staff kind of park in the back and then they have a gate that they will just scan their back and then let them in. So, hi. Uh, crosswalks, uh, the crosswalk from row down the campus where the kids uh, come for lunch. Uh, we have got purchased lights uh, for that area in addition to the 
assignment there. Uh, of course, we have to paint a few times a year. We're kind of fades off of the car still over it. And we're adding a crosswalk uh, across the street to Thomas because our kids want to cross that corner. So we're doing a formal crosswalk and adding a uh, uh, brick. Uh, it has purchased lights that will go into cones. So those will stay there and they're solar lights. So uh, we should be able to run those pretty efficiently. Uh, we're doing nightly door checks just to make sure everything uh, is closed on campus. Um, so we have tasked one person. Uh, one of Rick's staff is doing walking across campus just to make sure that every at night. At night. At night. Different shifts. Uh, once they're locked at night, uh, the third shift is responsible for uh, checking after that. But just those main office school buildings, making sure that they're locked. So, yep. And I want to commend our staff for doing a really good job. If anything looks out of place. Uh, uh, the team's doing a really good job of just calling the supervisor and letting them know that they need to talk to And it. it is not as common for a team of four to five of us being on the phone at night should an issue arise, either with the student or some of the state conferences, uh, counselors, and uh, our, our leadership team is Uh, oh, miscellaneous. We finished Monster Walk. Uh, that was a big success. So we had trick or, a trick or treat for the elementary kids on that Friday. And then on um, Sunday, our students came in and we had trunk or treat. Many of our staff uh, set up trunk or treat. Our retired teachers uh, decorated the cars and had it all fancy. I heard it looked good. I was not there because I was down at the haunted house. Um, as I told, I, I told uh, my team, I said, I can dish it out, but I can't take it. So I'm, I'm happy to dress up and scare somebody, but don't scare me. But the haunted house was in the basement of one of our buildings we no longer utilize. And the kids and the staff loved it. It was really good. Uh, Miss Gully uh, and Billy came through. And uh, so, but it was, it was really good. I think the kids enjoyed it. Uh, and then we had a dance and a big sensory tables uh, and a bonfire for high school kids after. It, it worked really well. Uh, the last thing is, uh, I'm very excited to announce and share with you all is on December 1st, the Kentucky Board of Education will be doing their quarterly meeting from our campus. Uh, so we are working with KDE to get that set up. We'll be doing that out of Grow Hall. Uh, so Jared and technology from KDE uh, are working to get that prepared. And then our students will be doing a presentation uh, to the board, uh, probably about 20, 15, 20 minutes, and then leave a little bit of time for questions. Uh, then we'll give them a tour of campus. I don't know that they're going to have that much time for a true tour, um, but we might be able to point to buildings out and stuff. And then uh, lastly, uh, I'm going to kind of steal a little bit of uh, Tease Thunder, but he's not online yet, so I'm just going to steal away. Uh, the one thing that we will be showing them is that. Uh, a full pool uh, when they get here. The pool should be up and running, and we should have it filled uh, prior to the visit on December 1st. So that's two big pieces of news we're excited about. Uh, T and then have done a, a really good job of getting it ready and ready to go. So we plan to fill it um, to, on the week of Thanksgiving. So it's just Everything stays in hopes. So it should be good. Um.
that for you. Any questions on any of the safety or things yet? I do have a question. It's not really a, a safety update, but maybe a little bit. But is there any way to fix it to maybe have to do something in elementary or when you knock on the door or push the button when there's a light that could be set up to let you know that someone's outside? Because we've had that before at the other elementary building and uh, to not have that light is not really that friendly. You have to depend on a sound. And Joe's in that office. I mean, he doesn't know if anyone's at the doorbell uh, waiting to get into the office. So I worked in that front office and I missed one person that was there banging on the door. Because I had to go out there working on the desk. At the desk, and I was like, oh no, I don't know how long that person had been standing at the door that I couldn't hear the sound of the doorbell. And I felt like I had to sit there the rest of that time just with my eyes looking out the window like a crazy person all the time. But if you can hear, you know, like you can hear that, but if you if you can't hear, then you really need a light to let you know. If you can get that fixed, that would be great. Yeah. Uh, I've asked Tommy, uh, Tommy before he was retired, um, before uh, Walter was taken down, if he could take that light out and move it. And he said, no, it was a different system. But I mean, it was wonderful. It worked great at Walker Hall. I'd love to have that again. And I uh, had that here as well. Yeah, it's all the same thing. A light that flashes, that the alert gets started, or the front desk. That's a big difference. I think here we do have something like that. It's a lot easier, but at Marshall, it, it's really a barrier. Also, one thing I forgot to add to is we got the front window uh, finally fixed. Uh, <laughs> but also, uh, we uh, hope to be adding a, a wall so that guests do not have access to this part of the building that they would only be fit in a straight office. They do not like just walking straight into the school. So we're trying to enhance that a little bit. So that's that's on our to-do list to fix it. Uh, and to let us know about the line is that's it. Or add it. That is part of the safe schools audit, you know. Um, to have it annexed like that to make sure that uh, people visiting don't have access to the students. Um, and that's one of the reasons why. Yeah, we don't think it'll be a, a, a big cost. You know, it's, it's important and it's, it's not. Okay. Um, that's all that I have. I have another question. Here in this building, you do have the doorbells at the doors, right? And you push that. Can that be fixed over at Marshall too in the elementary? Maybe. Yeah. I wonder if that could be installed because if we have a deaf staff member, they have the door locks. I think all, all the teachers actually have the door locks.
I add one more thing uh, regarding the fence um, that we have proposed. We did have property, you know, our campus already surveyed the outline of where exactly our property line is. And I think it's roughly 2015 or it was 2016. Um, but I cannot find the map when we had it surveyed originally. So I know there's some confusion about who owns what and where exactly that line is. But um, we had a community meeting once and it was determined that either Rick or someone, wherever we put the fence, um, has to get that surveyed and know exactly what belongs to KC's campus. Um, I do remember vaguely that there's a map somewhere on campus, but I think it would be important information to have. And if it's not found, then they have to ask uh, maybe KBE or KBE to find that map um, and share it with us. But at least the advisory board would like to know too. So if we did have the fence set up on campus, um, where would, would they have a designated location of where they would put that? And would it be that black um, style, that iron that we used to have? And you know, like if you have a visitor that comes, um, they could see that old style fencing. I feel like that would really be nice to add to the Stretch all the way around. Um, 
I don't know if you have to worry about having it match exactly. Yeah, that might be something again that uh, we might look at replacing that because it does not really stop somebody from just we don't you know we don't want anything to look like a prison, but it certainly wants to be pretty but functional because we just we have we still have way too many people crossing the campus. Yeah, I agree. Um, uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to do that, but I've got something like that because I sort of call it because they don't people sneaking into the games and whatnot. And so you kind of get an idea of what it could look like. It's pretty tall and um, pretty covered, and they've got that cool logo, like I said, in, in between the gaps, so that you know it kind of is aesthetically pleasing, but then also functional, like Troy had mentioned, so people are climbing over and whatnot. So, yeah, and I'm thinking of like little children as well. Um, you know, from what I've seen, um, whenever I was a little girl, you know, going through campus. Um, for my sister, I did come alongside the state of Tennessee to go to school when we got there. And I went there for three years in Nashville. And then that school closed, and I came back to the death school. And my mom was really upset about whether I should come to KSC or go to Tennessee school for the deaf. And my mom decided to go for a visit to Tennessee school for the deaf. And when we got there, I mean, they've got those fences up. And I know that one of my biggest memories is like thinking that I was going to prison when I pulled on campus because I was little. And that's just kind of what I saw and the impression I had. And that really made a difference of us deciding to come to KSC. You know, because it had a more warm, friendly environment when you first pulled onto campus, and it still felt safe, you know, but um, it kind of implied that crime and whatnot were in that area with that big fence. And so I know that there's a difference today than there was a long time ago, but a sense of security is important. I realize that, but also making sure we remember that we want that warm feeling of parents when they're coming on campus because. We definitely don't want their psyche to get in the way of thinking that, you know, their kids are going to be unsafe and we have to put up a fence to protect them because that's the type of area. So I think that that can really be determined by what type of fence that we get that puts off that type of vibe that, um, you know, we're protecting them, but still they're not adults squeezing through, you know, um, so something, something of that nature. Yeah, and I remember that I had that same thought when I went to Tennessee School for the Deaf about their fences there. Um, I definitely think the kind of fence to select, um, not, not definitely not having that barbed wire up there or anything like that, because that would definitely remind us of a prison. Um, and I had gone to, I think, several different schools, four or five different deaf schools to visit, uh, some really nice uh, uh, schools that, you know, I don't remember them having a lot of fences up. Uh, but if they did, it was more simple, uh, black, uh, not a lot of uh, stuff going on, very simple, modern style fences. Um, and I'm sure whatever they come up with now will be much better than what they had then. Um, and I'm sure if you go and look at Center College, you can see some of the ways that they modernize the fences, you know, that they don't want uh, to scare people, but they also want to keep people out. Sure, yeah, I, I know what you mean. Um, I think that we just don't want to give off the impression that we're trying to keep people out for a specific reason, but you know, I don't, I don't want to scare anyone when they're coming to campus, so that's a very fine line, especially little kids in the first impression. Just switching gears, the one thing I want to add is and that I forgot is a couple of myths. Yeah, one thing our students uh, started working on. Uh, is a disc, uh, a frisbee disc golf. Do you all know what that is? Okay. So um, our kids were wanting a course, and so this summer, uh, our summer school, middle school, and high school students came together, uh, presented their presentations, uh, then uh, we gave them a budget of five thousand dollars. Uh, those students are responsible for making that budget. They have met with the vendor. Uh, they have laid out a course. Uh, 
their course, the vendor was very impressed with the course that they, they come up with. And so progress is working and we just we want the kids to come away really. They have an advisory board that they have to report to. Um, on board progress, the money, money spent, they've not spent any money yet. Uh, but we were very pleased with what they're doing. We think they're gonna come away with some real life skills. Uh, for planning and employment. And then after this, uh, we want two things. We want them to manage the course uh, for the students on campus. And then we're hoping to also uh, uh, be competitive with this course uh, with other schools. So that has happened in Middle Kentucky. Uh, we'll be coming to campus on December, uh, November 16th, I believe. Um, for Read Across America, and she'll be with her elementary kids that day. She also, I believe, has a minor. I was told a minor in ASL, as well as an ag background. So we're very excited to have her. Oh, new hype, sorry. We've had two new hires since the last time that we've met. Uh, one is food service, and one was the bus driver. Uh, but we have had uh, several interviews recently, and uh, we have a lot of staff applying internally. Uh, so we're very excited to see uh, our staff want to grow and move up the, the ladder. Leadership, so we're excited about that. Uh, we do have two, uh, three teaching positions uh, that will post here shortly. Uh, one uh, we haven't posted yet, which is for CTE, because we're looking at uh, which route we want to go for CTE. We have to be very specific whether it's woodworking or construction. Uh, and then culinary, we posted that. We had nobody apply. Uh, it's hard in the building there to get somebody. Uh, and then our preschool position will be posted. Two preschool. Right, three, 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 three positions. Three positions. One preschool. CTE and two C.
Okay, thank you so much. Um, most of you know who I am, some of you may not. Uh, my name is Billy Belly Jr. I am the SLCI ASL coordinator here at KSC. I've been working here for almost four years in this role. Okay, so what is the SLCI ASL? Some of you may know, but some may not. So I'm just going to give you a brief summary of it before I go into the data. The SLCI stands for the S for Sign Language, Proficiency Interview, and then American Sign Language. So that's the language that we are evaluating. It used to just be ASL that was under the SLCI, but now they've added several languages, so we have to keep on ASL here. And we evaluate the conversational skills, not interpreting skills, not any other type of skills, but conversational ASL skills in a 20 minute clip. And we provide that for our students, our staff, and community members. Our students are just one part of the stakeholders that are included in this. It's a one to one recorded conversation between the interviewer and the student. Uh, it used to be pre-COVID that we used a camera, we had two seats, we communicated and it was recorded and then rated, but since COVID we've adjusted and now all of our interviews are virtual through Zoom, which has a uh, you know, good and bad to it, but there have been more pros that are going on to it since we've been virtual and that has been really, really forward. So typically once the recordings are created, we send them off to two, sometimes three raters who will uh, Come to a consensus with what rating and what level they are at, and then I pick that up and send it off to the student staff community members. And there are 11 levels that you can attain. It's kind of hard to see, I realize now, uh, but there are 11 levels, listed, like I mentioned. And the beginning is called No Functional Skills. That is the baseline. What we call it NFS. So just someone who's barely able to communicate, basically no sign language skills. So just an emerging signer, someone who's just starting off. And then it moves up progressively. Um, so it goes on to novice, novice plus survival, maybe two to three sentences you're able to communicate in. So you're not fully functional in ASL, but you are able to communicate and have some conversation. And then you have an intermediate, which is about three to five sentences in American Sign Language. So it's beginning to look more like a real conversation. And then uh, advanced, which most of our staff, have, we have a goal of all of them to reach the advanced level. Um, as well as interpreters. So most of our staff are reaching this level where you have turn taking skill, you're able to conversate, you can discuss an American sign language pretty comfortably. And then superior or higher is a native signer. So someone not necessarily deaf, but um, hearing people can reach this level, but it's someone who is signing like a native user of this language. So a lot of our deaf staff have reached this level. They have the expression and grammar really good there. So here at KSC, when I started in 2018, I brought this data along. Um, so the last four years, I have figured these are the different ratings that our students are at. And um, it's typically about the same, if you can see. There's not been a lot of improvement. Some have improvement, some don't. Some, uh, you know, with the lack of exposure to American Sign Language, it has significantly impacted their skill. So if you can see 2018 in blue, and then green 2021. So 2019, you see here, it's pretty balanced. Um, but 2018 and uh, from 2018 to 2019, there was a significant gain. And uh, the data that I researched, I saw that a lot of new students came in that year with no language. So that really impacted our data because they were able to really score um, and gain some skills, and then they kind of leveled off a little bit as the time went on. Um, the higher numbers, uh, you see a lot of students during those years, we have a lot of deaf plus students, we can call uh, deaf students with additional disabilities. Um, so a lot of those students are on the lowest level of no functional skills, but they do build and they are still showing improvement. Um, and then up to superior, there's not a lot of students at the superior level, but remember that that's someone who has been raised maybe at KSC their entire life, they have a deaf family, they're constantly exposed to the language, um, and they are 
always around American Sign Language and really have amazingly picked up that language. Now, some students have graduated, of course, and those are large numbers. So you can see that's impacted the numbers as it kind of shifts through the years. So that's kind of why those numbers look like that there. But that just gives you an idea of our students over the last four years. Um, and I think that, that just shows some growth. Um, there are some gains. Uh, and keep in mind that one level, uh, to improve one level takes three, four, sometimes five years. So you're not able to in one year go from no functional skills to a superior class. So this takes time. So this is pretty consistent with what we would expect to see from our students and the growth um, over the years and based on students coming and going and, and the different backgrounds that they are a part of. So from 2018 to 2019, you kind of see that difference at 2020, remember, was a COVID year, and that significantly impacted our students because of the inability to come to school. And they were at home. A lot of them were um, in situations where they were only able to access sign language through maybe technology, but we hadn't even set up Zoom at the very beginning. So that really um, impacted a lot of our students, and they missed out on interviews, particularly. That's why those numbers are so low. We weren't even able to evaluate them until they came back to the this last spring and then so as we go forward we'll be able to interview them remember part of the process is getting the raters as a team to score them so that takes time as well so we'll evaluate them in the spring and send those off to raters and get those back so i predict that 2021 will look pretty good i, I think that for most of our data you know it won't change a whole lot but there'll still be improvements Now, I want to kind of explain why there would be some declining in the student level for their slipping. Now, COVID, uh, this pandemic, we know, has had a lot of impact across the nation and across the world, but some of the decline in students could be from them being at home, our students not being able to communicate with their parents, not being able to be exposed to sign language like they are here on campus 24-7. Uh, and then maybe at the time of the interview, their skills have plateaued or um, maybe they have regressed because there was not enough usage of American Sign Language while they were at home so they were able to come to campus. And I, another factor that I think might be a part of this is that we were doing in-person interviews, but because of COVID, we're having to do virtual, which is a whole different dynamic for our students and they have thrown off the sport a little bit. Um, it's the first time that we're interviewing. Zoom, so that might have influenced them. I'm not entirely sure, so I'm keeping track of that as we go forward to see how much of an impact that's made. But some of our students are very distracted and very thrown off to try to use Zoom and figure out what's going on versus an in-person interview. They feel like they're talking to a machine and not necessarily a person. So I do feel like that's influenced some of our scores as well. And then also, like I mentioned, some of our students weren't even interviewed. Um, there's a high percentage of students who have great American Sign Language skills, but due to COVID, were at home, didn't have the technology or the internet access to be able to be interviewed, so they were not listed this past year. And um, I could be wrong, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that ASL tutoring was also suspended um, during the pandemic for that entire year. So that really significantly impacted our students not being able to have access to American Sign Language during the mentoring of our students and so they weren't learning. Um, and so there was minimal growth during that time and I think that was due to um, not being able to provide tutoring. Uh, different interviewers. For the elementary in years past, we always had one interviewer for each department. Um, and then as that student moved on to different departments, they were interviewed by a different person. So it might have thrown them off being interviewed by someone they were unfamiliar with, answering questions, different styles of sign language. And I feel like that may have made an impact on some of their scores as well. And in 2019, um, some of them may have had an intermediate, but I want to clarify that if you're on the intermediate level um, and you just barely are in that range, um, any of these different factors could have impacted you being pushed back into the survival plus level. And so that following year, you may have kind of fallen just below that range. 
And just because we're using sign language here every day does not mean that our students' language is growing every day. That it really can vary just depending on the individual, just like their test scores can vary, just like their learning in the classroom can vary. And so their interactions with individuals um, are different. And you know, I may sometimes you may be impacted by some signing style, some different uh, philosophies, maybe someone signs more English and you kind of adopt that, it influences you more than you influence them. And so it really depends on if you're with strong native ASL users or if you're with people who are emerging sign users that can really impact the levels of our students and how they're able to gauge and improve their skills. You may have noticed that there was a, a year that had a high number of students. Uh, we had a high number of enrollment for students coming into campus, but they did not sign. For whatever reason, they weren't successful in their mainstream programs and they came here with minimal skills. Or some of them may have been using uh, English sign language and not American sign language. And so that really impacted them that maybe you're understanding them, but remember the SILPI is for ASL grammar. And so it's a big difference. Oh, sorry. And then also uh, it depends on the students uh, preference for their mode of communication. Some of them are not American Sign Language users. Some of them are hard of hearing. They have some residual hearing. They have some speech. And so they do not have strong sign language skills because their mode of communication is to speak um, or to hear. And so that can impact their skills because of a variety of reasons that might have impacted some of our data in the past few years. Any questions? Uh, yes, I just have a question for you. Uh, my experience over at the um, it was not very deaf friendly, you know, uh, that environment. Doing it over Zoom, um, it, it, we had lots of technology problems, the screen would freeze up on you, and it was just so overwhelming for a, a whole class to go through Zoom. Um, and we set up a platform for the class, and I feel like it's really nice to be back on campus and see some faces and facial expressions without using the screen. I really do feel like COVID has had a major impact on the scores and you think about um, all the things that the students had to go through. Um, it just, it's not the same. It's a challenge for our students. I agree. And, you know, I've been working on Zoom and I'm doing virtual interviews and the room that I interview in is really not COVID friendly. There's no vent in that room. So I really, it's not conducive to having interviews in person. And so um, we decided to continue it virtually. Um, there are some community members though that like it. So here's some of the pros because not having to drive all the way to campus. So that really is nice for them, but maybe not so much for our staff and students. So we're trying to come up with a way to um, meet both of those needs and benefit everyone. Uh, but one advantage that we have here is that we have hired a part-time ASL specialist, Samantha Fowler. And she has been working with the elementary department. And so I'm looking forward to having her help um, with some of those classes and that impacting our data and our students' sign language skills here. And so it's nice because it was just me for four years, you know, focusing on American Sign Language and those skills and that language, but it's nice to have a second person to be able to work with and have exposure for our students. I really think that that's a good indicator of the success our students are going to have moving forward. Uh, also, uh, hold on just a second. Uh, for sign classes that are offered to those students, I mean, are, are for them to be able to practice their perceptive and expressive skills. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's something we can look for and moving forward of having specific classes for those students who have common uh, challenges. I know that Cheyenne Jenny, for instance, with her community sign classes used to offer has now shifted more American Sign Language tutoring to families, which is really nice because families are at home. And so now we're impacting the students when they go home after they leave here. If we're getting parents signing, then that means that's more of an opportunity for our students to improve their skills at both places. And so it's not that we can, um, you know, our students do regress at times in different areas, all students do, but it's nice that we have a bigger team. Um, Slippy, I really wear two hats. I've really begun to do more of an ASL part of campus and help tutor a lot of staff and students. I've enjoyed that, but it's really nice to have a Samantha part of the team as well. Uh, I agree with Scott's comment. Uh, I remember in the past, maybe two or three teachers we had on campus that taught ASL class. And I'm wondering if that, uh, like with the students, 
students that are learning it till after school um, for 30 minutes each when they're being tutored. Uh, if that is impacting your score, that we have any data on that, um, do you know? So I'm not sure if that's something we're already providing or Scott, you know, you can speak to that if the WHS grant is covering that. Yes, one person is involved. Okay, so we're doing two separate things. Um, same goal though, but he's looking for the WHS program for tutoring. We do have one. Yes. So if we have, uh, you know, a, a group of students that we could want together at the same level, then uh, is that something you guys are considering doing? Yeah, I don't have to talk with Cindy Curtis because she is that's something that we can kind of um, usually we do one on one tutoring, so we'll have to look into that. Um, I really liked uh, your report, really. Um, I really liked being able to see that data uh, in the past four years. Um, and I think that is really key uh, to, to have that data to help us to improve on how we are serving our students, and especially during having data during COVID. You know, the kids being at home with their parents and more than likely their parents not having uh, good science skills, you know, that home environment that they're in. Um, and, you know, that's the background that, that our kids are coming from, which is also a stressful background, which when you, when you put that stress on a student, that's going to be their ability to learn and then send them back to that home environment um, where they don't have access to communication. And they're missing a lot of that. Of course, we're going to see that regression. I think you know that's when you saw those um, those numbers that you found in the data that we're at the green regression. You know, because those kids, I mean, we all struggled during COVID, and we had that added stress, um, and they're just trying to get caught up with the time. It's been really nice that. Um, you know, I grew up in a deaf family. I came to KSB. I really didn't understand language deprivation, having issues communicating. I mean, I just always had access to that. All my friends could sign. I, it was never an issue. And it wasn't until uh, I met my ex-wife that um, her family, when I went to go with them, she was deaf, but her family was not. And she could, she was hard of hearing, so she could hear with the hearing aid and speak for the most part. But I sat around, and I felt like an unintelligible person. Like, I, I just felt like I had nothing to contribute. And it really impacted me just, I mean, I grew up in a deaf family, but if I had grown up in a family like that, I just don't think that I would be where I am today. And I've just been really fortunate. I mean, I might be just doing, you know, hard labor at Eastern Kentucky somewhere. And I, I mean, that that was where she was from. And I just really, it shook me to the core to know that that's very important. Language is important. If you can't communicate your basic wants and needs, or even more than that, where, what are we doing for our students? And so... I really want all of our students to have that same opportunity that I did. You know, I want them to be able to communicate, at least to express how they're feeling. You know, some of them have that at home and it's amazing that, but some of them can't even show their parents what they're doing at school or express their emotions. And that's just a really big gap that here at KC we're trying to, to bridge. And I think that's nice that Cheyenne's program is helping at home and then we're doing this on the front end here at school. I did have a question. I don't know if you're a member. So tell me if I'm remembering this correctly. Right, so this set of these evaluations of evaluators, um, and that was, I have copies in my office of the goals, um, and we're supposed to finish with the test. Now I was thinking that we were going to put that in the IEP, and so will that data be shared with someone who you finished your job with your evaluation? Oh, with your evaluation. Those results, that information will be shared with someone. And we're saying yes, they are shared. Uh, and then we're saying, yeah, I do put the rating in the campus, and I also do um, at the end there is like a little section for feedback. That's all on in the campus um, and available to anyone working on their IEP that they can include in the group. I don't know if anyone, you know, who's looking. I don't have a way of seeing that, but it is all there to be accessed. Um, and there's not goals necessarily, but there is. Areas of weakness, areas of strength, so that's that can be focused on. So we have three ASL teachers for each level now in elementary school and high school. Uh, 
Um, I believe that now Samantha Fowler is working with the elementary, but middle school and high school does have um, instruction. I don't know if they have specific classes necessarily, or um, they divide them up, but they're, they're part-time people that are coming in and working with them, and then I'm doing this cooking for them. So I heard if I'm wrong, but I think we're looking to uh, utilize Samantha uh, as kind of a response to intervention um, to identify those kids who need to advance that way. Whereas we're, 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 we're identifying kids at the elementary uh, during, I guess, late morning, but that first and second period is when we'll pull those kids as, as needed. Good, good, good. Okay. Um, that's really wonderful. She's wonderful. Good. Um, and Samantha is new, but um, she, she's only working part time here. She has other commitments in the afternoon. She's actually working at the ASL teacher at West Jessamine. Um, and so she's best utilized here in the morning with the elementary. And our hopes is in the future she'll be all day. I mean, we've got all sorts of ideas. We're just waiting for more time in her day, um, you know. So, uh, but we're, we're currently working together, and hopefully, this will be a long term uh, solution. And then we can kind of focus on other issues that our students are facing. Right. Any more questions from Dr. Fuller? No problem. Thank you. All right. Our next is Juan Bodner, who is going to be talking about the 200th anniversary events and planning. Can you give us a message? Uh, yeah, Barbara Harris, too. Hi, my name is Melinda Bowman, and I am a co-chairperson. I am working directly with the little part here. She's boss. I do whatever she tells me to do. Um, anyway, uh, regarding finances, I just want to report on that. And the first quarter was already passed, so now we're going to move into the second quarter. And I wanted to discuss what we've been able to raise so far. We've got a lot of people donating money and sending it in, slowly but surely. We have deposited $4,427.05. And we have spent for the first time uh, going to Louisville to the um, a deaf organization there to sell crafts. And so we were able to, uh, we spent $277.95 on a booth there. And so on June 30th, we had $4,149.10. Our third quarter, we deposited $5,800. $4.21 and spent $765.96. That was for t shirts in honor of Mr. Pinky for a fun run that we hope to do at ASU. As of September 30th, our balance is $5,825. And uh, speaking of the Pinky Fun Run, uh, we had that on September 26th, and people registered and total we approved $2,420 and spent because of medals, um, incidental awards, t-shirts, and the cost that occurred through that $1,448.41. Now, our net profit after that entire event was $1,200.71. So I think that was pretty good for our first year honoring Mr. Pinky, who was a, a retiree of KSU. Now, for campus, we have several committees. Um, actually, before I get to that, the alumni organization is working together, and we want to thank KDE and Ms. Roby um, for signing the approval for events that we're going to have beginning next year. We were able to get the facilities forum signed off, and Barbie and I have been working together to fill in the dates that the alumni will be working on to host for the 200th celebration. Uh, which I will pass along to you as visitors. Uh, we'll share that out here in the next coming months with different responsibilities and planning that goes into financially, um, hotels, you know, requesting off from work and whatnot. Um, we want everyone to be able to attend all of our events. So I will share that with all of you as soon as we come here. Um, as far as our campus committees, soon. When I say soon, I mean three weeks, because my gosh, it's almost Thanksgiving. After Thanksgiving, I will contact Ms. Roby 
and our committee will begin start the process of planning those monthly events in honor of the 200th year. Um, these are campus events on the front, and then on the back are other ones. Um, we are going through kind of our discussion. Still, some of those, some are part of the alumni, some are in conjunction with data So we're looking to do some of those events. But I strongly encourage people to tell everyone you know we are working really hard, but we do still need donations. Our goal is twenty thousand dollars to help cover all of the events that we would like to have provided. So we have about six thousand dollars. So we're close. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well. I did want to thank Ms. Rosen and the Kentucky Department of Education for getting the signups going and uh, for all of your work in communicating with us about uh, the committees that are on campus um, and getting the word out to staff and students and dorm members and parents and alumni that are out in the community, different groups of organizations that have gotten involved. I think we have 25 different um, with different uh, topics that they are all focused on. And so we are getting the process started. The first one will be MBO, uh, the Mini Deck Olympics. We're in the planning uh, various planning stages of that and getting that process started. So that's a work in progress right now. And just recently, I think uh, since July, am I getting that right on the? Oh, yeah, it was good. We, uh, as a committee, have been working towards uh, the quilting, the women's quilting, uh, making a quilt of different things. Um, not necessarily a blanket. Uh, but like runners, things that can be hung, uh, things that uh, you can decorate with, even hot pads that you can use in the kitchen, um, gloves, hot gloves to use for the stove and the oven. Um, we've got two men that are working on wood uh, working items that they're building for these events. Um, and I did want uh, to ask Ms. Roby and the library directors uh, if this website that we have just posted uh, last night uh, would find this in any way, getting this all uh, put together. We've been working on it together for the past month to get ready, and we finally have it up. So we did want to show this to you tonight um, to show instructions on how. We have 20 different things going on on this site. So uh, if you guys have time to take a look at this, um, yes, view all items. I know it's running slow, but anyway, I did want to show this to you all tonight about the auction. We'll be starting that tomorrow night at midnight. It will open and it will run through uh, Wednesday. It'll run a full week till Wednesday at midnight. And then that auction will close. And we do have some other auctions that will be doing similar to that with so many beautiful items that people have made and contributed. And so you can even have pictures here and see the things that they've made and bid on each item. I've had covered here. Um, here's some of the hot pads. This is a checkerboard. Handmade. Uh, we've got this table runner here. This quilt is made from all KSC t shirts that have been donated uh, by one person, Joyce Chrysler. Or Joyce Chrysler made this quilt using KSC t shirts. Um, these are more things that you can put on the ground for uh, little babies toddlers to use, kind of like little soft padded uh, play mats. Uh, we've got mats that have been handmade, uh, uh, lots of different designs. Look at this beautiful 
walnut chest that's been made. We've got some dish towels that have a Jacob Holmes room on them. Nancy Perry made that. Okay, so lots of handmade things um, made from scraps, uh, just things that people had available to them. Um, and the purpose of this is obviously to raise money that we will set aside to purchase some specific materials um, for the 200th celebration. Uh, we need to make banners for that. We'll be making a quilt for the 200th anniversary that will have different logos across it. Uh, they'll have the different buildings that are on our campus. Um, we have one in the museum that's very old uh, from the 75th anniversary, but we want to make a new one with all of the new additions to our campus that we've had since then. Um, not only a quilt, but also um, fundraising for the 200 and all the other things that are involved in that. So our quilting group has been working hard and you know they've been getting some materials donated to them and getting some things in to use uh, to make that quilt. I think they've gotten 20. We're only allowed to list 20 items on this website at a time. Um, he made that really canvas here in the door and he substitute. Um, and he made that yeah. wooden cherry walnut for my construction. What about it? You make this so it only allows us to list 20 items, um, but we do have over 20 items. Um, but it will charge us on this website to list more than 20. So we have to have separate options and only list 20 at a time because it just limits us to 20. Um, we've got people in Florida, in Lexington, in Louisville, in Texas, uh, all over the United States. Um, and also, of course, many in the Kentucky area. And we're just so thankful for all the people that have been involved with this. Um, we do have other committees that are working on other things. They're trying to make movies uh, and doing some filming that they're going to put together for the 200th celebration. Um, like we have old 1823 pictures. Uh, we're going to do like a picture reel of those old time photos that we have and try to get those added. Um, uh, this will be made by Jessica Hendrick's wife. She's very skilled at putting all this stuff together in uh, set up. And we're just going to have like an appreciation banquet and um, several different events that we have coming up. Um, this right here, uh, you can see that it has all these different patches on it with uh, different handshakes. These are all cross stitched. Uh, we have Jacob's Hall Museum cross stitched on a uh, one patch of this quilt. All right. Oh. There we go. You can see it better now. Um, so uh, we're going to start that uh, silent auction on this. Any questions? Yeah, I've got a question. When is the bidding begin again? It'll start Wednesday night, tomorrow night at midnight. It will open and it will run for one week and close that following Wednesday night at midnight. And then another one will uh, pop up a couple of weeks later uh, with some other items. So how do you get this if it's something on Facebook or well, uh, we're either sharing it on Facebook, sending out the link to this website on Facebook, and asking others to share it that uh, are able to. I haven't got it yet, so I don't think any of us have. Oh, the advisory board. I did send a link, um, and if you click that link, it will open up this page. You do not have to be a member of Facebook to access it. Okay, good idea. 
Jared is working on a 200 uh, year celebration page for our website. And we'll see that. Uh, Jared also uh, put on the KSC website, um, we're wanting him to put a countdown so we can option for him to open up on the KSC homepage so that people like our kids' family members can see it um, and just get that bidding going really fast and you know, we can get these items sold and the money raised. Yeah, I really appreciate uh, your work with Amy and designing this website and getting this up and running and getting word out to everyone. I'm thrilled at the progress of this. I really think it's beneficial. I was thinking um, in June, I remember that you were gathering all this materials and taking it to Louisville um, to sell at some booths there. But I'm wondering if there's any events in our deaf communities that are coming up that maybe we can do that again as well. Typically here in Kentucky in the fall, we have different festivals, um, arts and crafts festivals, um, and I'm just wondering if we can tap into some of those events and maybe sell some of our products there, uh, like in Maria or um, um, Crafts of Kentucky. I, I know that there's an Andy one that they have in Case City, Kentucky. You know, there's got to be more that we can maybe set up booths and sell that are not necessarily for our deaf community, but that we can open up to the general public of people who might have an interest in some of these beautiful products that we offer and may share with their families and, you know, kind of get the word spread out through a different outlet. Well, uh, I know that right now, because of COVID, um, I, I feel like those opportunities are, are low. Um, so I feel like it might be difficult to get people out in the public, you know, and, you know public venues, it's not like it was. So volunteers are very hard to find right now. Um, and we just are slim on uh, the options that we have. I think we have like four uh, of us that have been working on this so far, um, just to try to get $250 at a time. Um, so uh, I feel like we just decided to spend all of our focus on getting this up and running uh, so that we can get these auctions going and people don't have to get out. They can do it from the comfort of their own home. Um, and when things are better, then we could try the other uh, more public settings um, like games and things like that when they're open. Oh, I did have one more thing and I feel like the thought has Okay, I got one. Um, my, this last question, I promise. The goal is to raise twenty thousand dollars for the two hundredth anniversary celebration. Now, have you contacted the uh, Will County Courthouse? Um, have you contacted yes. Center College? Yes. Um, there's several places, City Hall, that might be willing to sponsor and be a part of this. And KC is a part of their community as well. Thank you. Yes, KCDHH is uh, partnering with us. Um, and the, all those places that you mentioned, we have reached out to them, and we're still waiting on uh, them to respond. Um, but there's just so many different things that we've got going right now. Okay, and I did want to just say the foundation as well. Uh, please reach out to us. We typically do only donate for kids, but if you have some activities that are kids oh, friendly, you can definitely yes. donate for that. Well, like national organizations for the deaf. Please reach out to them. There's several um, National Association for the Deaf, Kentucky Association for the Deaf. Um, I can't remember what. It's hearing loss. It's like, I'm talking in no, it's like H L A A. Um, anyway, there's several uh, organizations that are bigger, and maybe we could reach out to. I don't think there were. Those different hard. groups, actually, we are still waiting on them to sign up. We have reached out to them, um, they're still awaiting their response. But we have sent all that out and we have our schedule ready. Um, and so we're in the process of getting all of that posted on Facebook and uh, those messages sent out on who we have secured so far. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Barbie. Thank you guys for taking the time to come tonight.
Uh, have you thought about sending something out mail wise, good old fashioned snail mail to get sponsors that way? Um, I know that yeah. that can reach a different group of people. Um, and maybe if you have like envelopes, you know, folks that save, that might be a way to get some donations as well. Okay. Well, I did want to show you our logo on the top of this page, if I could. Um, we did have a competition last year or two years ago. I think. I'm sorry, yes, it was two years ago where uh, we selected the logo. Um, we got our students involved. They had an art competition and were able to come up with different designs for the 200th anniversary celebration. And so we separated them out into elementary, middle, and high school groups to compete against one another. Um, and so we decided that for our judges, we would select five artists that were out uh, in uh, other deaf communities. Uh, we had three from Washington State. Uh, and I think they all graduated from KC, actually. And two, let's see, one of those. Two of them, one was from Florida and the other was from Georgia. And so those five deaf artists, uh, we sent their uh, the students' artwork to them. And um, we did not tell them the name of the student or any uh, student demographic information was shared, none of that was shared. And then we sent the artwork out to them and they gave us the first, second, and third place winner uh, for each group. So then we selected the students and they told us the student winners. Um, the student who designed, designed this graduated and is at Center College right now. Um, and so it was a very beautiful logo you can see at the top of this page. And uh, we had it taken to the print shop at Penn Planet and they were able to get all the uh, sizing and clean it up for us. So I just wanted to point that out. It's going to be our letterhead. We're going to use it on t shirts. Um, a few different things. Thank you. Thank you, Barbie. You guys have done great work. Thank you so much. Okay. And um, thank you so much for all your work. It's been great. Thanks for supporting KSC and being a part of the celebration. It's a great job. Up next is Mr. Keith Hewlett. Um, he is going to be giving us some updates on capital projects that we have currently going on. All right. Our uh, Zoom link is blocking up. So, what I'm going to try to do is just call him and have a little sign. Okay, let's try it this way and just exit out of this. Yeah, I'm good. Okay. All right. So James is here. Um, if you're ready to go, if you're ready to go. Yes. Thank you. 
glad that you were able to share an update of all these capital projects to catch us up on all the events. I know you're doing your best to ensure our campus is improving and making sure that 
Um, we're keeping things together. Um, so you're doing an outstanding job. I know that our kids and our staff are really grateful to see all the work and progress that's been going on. Um, I am wondering if there's still a plan to work on Nancy Lee Hall at all, or what are we doing with that building? If there's anything in the future regarding Nancy Lee Hall. Glad to hear that. Uh, yes, yeah, so for the timeline of the six year plan, does that mean like hopefully our goal would be to meet all of these projects and have them finished by 2027? Yeah, I, I definitely have seen the, the price to increase uh, in everything, which has skyrocketed. Uh, it's like double or triple the price of what it used to be. It's definitely, I know that has to definitely be impacting our six year plan. So I really hope that uh, maybe those costs will start coming down soon, hopefully the next year or two, uh, so that maybe hopefully that could get us back on track with the budget that we guys have. Um, so. I have heard some of these things that you've mentioned, so hopefully um, the legislation will, uh, like you said, have it in their hearts to, to give us a little bit more so that uh, we can keep working on some of these other projects and hopefully also that those prices will start coming down. Um, thank you for all your work and all of the information. Mr. Hewlett. Sorry. Yes, thank you, Mr. T. Um, you do great work, and this is really good news to hear. I'm glad to see that things are moving along and that we're progressing. I know that it's a goal that we set, and so we're just working towards that and trying to move on. So thank you. Um, also, I think we should consider inviting our legislators to come to campus. I think that once you get an eye on some things, maybe a legislator day where we meet the kids and administrators and staff and our advisory board, whomever, and just get them here. I think that really can make an impact in some of the decisions that we're making to support. So I don't know, Ms. Roby, if you can get Katie to work on that, get permission to have a day like that and, and partner with them and just kind of get them interacting with the people that they're really impacting on a day-to-day -day basis. If that's a recommendation, if that's a recommendation, okay. Yeah, I would like to recommend that. I think that would be great. So, yeah. Yeah, I think we do have to work closely with this legislation. I understand that they have a lot going on um, and that um, they're not, oh, they're a little removed from what's going on here. So as much as we can get them involved from the senators and whatnot um, that are representing our community and make sure that they're fully understanding what 
it is that we're meeting and that we can kind of work together and understand what they need. I think that'll really impact some of the projects that we can consider in the future. Also, we remind our legislators um, like our students are from other districts, Western Kentucky, well, Eastern well, Kentucky. Well, I, I'm well, sure they don't realize that they come from so well, far away. But well, yes, well, those students are in some of their home districts of you well, know well, the legislators where they live, where right they're from. So and not only the Angle, not only Will County, but all over the state. So thank you, Mr. <laughs> Okay, moving on to the next part of our agenda. Um, we do need a budget update from Katie about what we had proposed um, so that we are aware of um, what we're communicating to the legislator and make sure that we're supporting that. Also, um, considering um, and letting them know about special events that are happening on campus, the board would like to participate in any events that KSB is hosting, would like to help in any way, visiting, putting the word out, coming and volunteering, uh, whatever is needed. Uh, the legislature today was probably already written down. Explore additional financing, um, funding for Jacobs Hall. Um, if we can look for additional sources and find alternate ways to work with and partner with the city of Danville, Boulder County, uh, maybe on the state level, even the, the foundation, and get together to try and find uh, whether it's writing grants, um, but maybe just the legislators, maybe they can help fund something in honor of our 200 celebration. I, I just want to remind people that the KSB has been around since 1823, thanks. Because of the legislators. And so, if we can go back to our roots, you know, it's 2023, 200 years later, we are in need of their support again, like we were 200 years ago in renovating the building. Um, Jacob Hall is in dire need of that. The next recommendation um, requesting that JDE find uh, the property lines, the surveyor map. Um, that shows the boundaries of KSB's campus. So we know what exactly belongs to KSB and what doesn't. I think that's really nice to have um, a historical trend as well um, from where we started to the current and then moving forward so that people are aware of how our campus is shifting. And um, as we start to build that fence, making sure that it is on our very own property, you know, and that there's not any issues that might arise later. And then most importantly, requesting that KBE and our legislators add into the language and the regulations about surplus property of KSB that we ensure that the language is there that says that money and funding comes back to KSB once it is sold and that profit is made. I know that it seems silly, but it's important that we actually specify that it comes back to us and not elsewhere. Um, so I would like to recommend that that be recommended. Those are some of mine that I have. I don't know if anyone has any others or if anyone has any questions. I remember having a conversation before about um, the money being transferred to KSB uh, account. Uh, was that last year or two years ago? Okay, two years ago. Um, we had talked. Had, we had that discussion with KDE yet, making sure that the sale of our property um, or anything like that comes back into our account, or is that still on hold? That's a good point. I do remember that Mr. Hewlett had explained to. And then Sequoia, uh, she explained to us that June 30th, 2020, yes, there, there was a, a timeline that the property uh, needed to be sold, uh, I believe it was for June 30, uh, so that we could have the money come to campus because that expired after that day. And that money did, uh, the sale of Walker Hall, that money did come back to the employees. 
but all because of KFC, he sparked and ignited that fire across the United States to have a truly deaf environment for our uh, deaf students. And so that 200 celebration should be um, celebrated for that. In 1973, I lived in Virginia and I moved here. And I lived here for several years. And then 1998, we celebrated the 175th anniversary. And I was the chairperson in Virginia of that committee. I planned that and helped it become successful. It was wonderful. And now here we are at the 200 celebration. And I am looking forward to a great job, better than what Virginia had, uh, better than the uh, New York and Stanwood and all in Philadelphia. There have been many, many schools that have followed after us and are going to be having their 200 celebration. But I really want to set the bar high that we can really shine. That is the goal that I have for our school because I love it so much. Okay. Um, also, I do want to tell you that 2023, we are going to be having uh, hosting the Mason Dixon tournament here. We better get started. We've got to get committees again. We need a team that's going to participate in that tournament. So we really got to get behind that and push for that. All right. Also, the number of deaf teachers here is slowly dwindling to a scary number. It is very important that we are hiring deaf individuals to work directly with our deaf children mm -hmm. because they're able to not only share the language but their experiences with our students and influence them in what they become after they graduate from here. For example, I was a math teacher. I always preached to my students that deaf can do anything. I was a living, walking, breathing example of that. And they know that, but it's good for them to see that and have opportunities to see people doing that that are like them and giving them tips on what they should do in case they were to encounter issues. We have lived it and we really can be those role models for them. Okay, we can also suggest jobs that they'd be better suited for and maybe environments or, or companies that they can work for. And I think that's something our school should strive for to really get more deaf people to come to work here at KC. That's one of the things I do. Um, I have a question. What is the status? I need to stop you. You have to ask questions directly to the chairman. I apologize. You can't ask to any of the Um, I apologize. Everyone, forget that question. Thank you. Uh, I have a question then for them. Um, what is the status of our school mission? I'm not asking you to answer that right now. Obviously, I only have five minutes left in that now, but I do want something if you could follow up with me about our mission for KSC in February, whatever. And I'm getting down to the bottom, don't worry. Improving our enrollment here at KSC. I did mention that already, but I have noticed that there's a lot of people working here who do not sign, that people are talking in front of our deaf children and we cannot allow that. That is not fair to our kids who come here. They face that in public school, and in public school, hearing kids listen to that incidental conversation with teachers, and they're constantly bombarded with that information, and their language drastically improves. That is not an opportunity that our deaf students have. And when they're here, they should have that same thing. This is not a place for hearing people to um, encourage English, per se, and spoken language, but more to emphasize American Sign Language for our students. Also, the outreach group here um, does a good job of working with people out in the state, but I do think that we can do better to publicize what KSC is doing and show other students to help our enrollment go up. We have lots of great teachers that work here. We have wonderful teachers, we have great leaders, we have a great group of interpreters like this one, this one, this one, and that one. I mean, we've got the best people here and they're willing to work here at KSC. I'm grateful to interpreters, but we have that. We need to let the whole state of Kentucky know what we have to offer. And I would, Okay, maybe this is none of my business, but I would really like to serve on an interview committee that is screening or evaluating who is making it through the interview process and actually being interviewed. Okay, I'm not asking you to give me an answer if I can do that, but maybe by the next meeting we can come up with a plan to have some different people involved in that process. I think I have it all covered. One minute, she said, Oh my, okay, one minute, I'll take advantage of that. I have a lot of people that have graduated from KSC. And so today I want to highlight that person, and it's Sandra Frank. Some of you may know her. She graduated from KSC. Unfortunately, she was not given the recognition in uh, public settings of graduating from KSC because she was a part of her mainstream program in Lexington, but very Louisville. But I do want to say that she is a part of a group that is in a production 
that is performing on TV on Broadway that you guys may be able to watch and access that you can see some of our students shine. Uh, there are people that are working in the CIA, there are people that are working at Toyota, UPS, Amazon. We've got some that have become teachers at deaf schools across the nation. My very own daughter graduated from here. She's an architect in Washington. My son, he became a pastor, but he's also an ASL teacher in New Jersey. I've got another son that graduated from here that's teaching at the University of Louisville as an ASL teacher. Um, I think it's called an assistant professor, but our kids are doing great things. I see here some of my time is up, so I will stop now. Thank you very much. Thank you for your do we have a motion to adjourn our meeting uh, thank you nancy second that by bridget thank you uh, oh i'm sorry Jessica, to you. I saw him first but thank you very much all in favor thank you we'll see you all next year thank you for coming and